Psalm 9 tells us here this morning, uh, Psalm of David, and he says to us, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. So if we could stand, please, if you are able, for the invocation and the Lord's Prayer, we shall pray together and invite him. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for letting us come together in this wonderful place, a place where you have given us to come together to fellowship, to worship, to praise, to bring adoration to you with our songs and our words and certainly all our deeds. Come to us, Lord. Draw nigh to us, Lord, for we draw nigh to you to bring glory to you. Thank you for the opportunity you have given us. Thank you for the freedoms that we have to do so. So accept our worship here this morning, Father. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm reading from Revelation chapter 1. Book of Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. 
In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we approach you today in prayer, but uh, we recognize that the words of our prayers are small, and uh, Lord, in the light of your glory, it is difficult for us to enunciate anything that will uh, begin to approach the glory of your name. But we've gathered necessarily today because our hearts compel us to and our spirits compel us to. We gather together in this place to worship. And we worship a great God who has given us a great Son and a Spirit that lives within us and moves among us in this place and in our hearts as we take these temples, unworthy as they are, out into the world in which we live. And Lord, we pray as you go with us and as you uh, reside with us this morning, We pray that you would give us fresh insight into your glory, uh, that you would uh, enable us to uh, experience your power and experience something that is uh, genuine, something that is divine, and something that will give us uh, encouragement to move forward and to advance in our faith and in the faith that we share with others. We thank you for the words of uh, the choir, uh, singing, give thanks, and uh, praising the glory of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the prayers already uttered. We thank you for the hearts that have already bowed uh, before you in service. And Lord, we pray that in this worship service, our hearts and our minds and and, uh, the focus of our being would bring some pleasure to the heart of the Almighty. We thank you for everything you do for us. We cannot even grasp how large that is. But Lord, we do thank you this day, and we pray your blessing upon us and upon this service and every element of it. In Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know how many of you um, are Gilbert and Sullivan fans. I enjoy Gilbert and Sullivan, and uh, there are, has nothing to do with the singing sisters. In fact, when I saw it in the bulletin, I thought maybe it was going to be a group of nuns here this morning, you know, uh, at first. (laughs) Close, yeah. Um, In the uh, the Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, uh, The Mikado, the Lord High Executioner is uh, singing a song where he is debating about the various ways that he could execute somebody. And they're very colorful and they're very customized uh, to the offense. And he said that uh, some people who blather on and on, uh, particularly politicians, would be sent to hear sermons by mystical Germans who preach from 10 till 4. 10 to 4 is a long sermon. That's, that's a six-hour sermon, right? Well, um, I'm German, but uh, I'm, I've never preached uh, from 10 till 4. But uh, as I was preparing this message, my mind is going all over the place because I'm th- it's, it has to do with um, who we see Jesus as and, and how we approach things when we when we come to a worship setting. A few years ago, I was uh, uh, taking a graduate course, and 
uh, I was uh, taking a day off from my Sunday, regular Sunday job as pastor of an evangelical church, and I was sitting in a very liturgical church where every part of the service was uh, prescribed, and everybody knew when each thing happened. And it was remarkable to me, because this church was probably ten times larger than mine, uh, it, it was remarkable to me that you could hear a pin drop from the moment that the offertory began uh, at the beginning of the service. But then I also remarked that nobody had to really think about anything because everything was prescribed. And so that's, that's one way of doing things. And then... Um, uh, I, I was thinking about uh, my setting has always been an evangelical setting. I wasn't raised in a liturgical setting. I was raised in an evangelical setting. And so we have this evangelical chatter that happens uh, at the beginning before we begin the service. Uh, there's more chatter in churches where people like each other. It's a good thing when people aren't fighting uh, because if they're fighting, they may sit with crossed arms and frowns on their faces, and they don't like each other, so they're not talking. Uh, it, it's good that they're talking. But how we gather into this room this morning to hold a worship service, uh, and worship implies that the lowly give honor and reverence to one who is high and lifted up. If we see God as the Almighty, who is high and lifted up, that informs us uh, in our hearts and in our minds on the, the kind of behavior and, and kind of worship posture uh, that we have. The attitude in which we gather uh, on this Sunday or any other is an indication and was an indication when we came in of where uh, we our minds were and what we actually anticipated to happen. And whether we were walking in the door giving honor and reverence to a high and holy being. The manner in which we found our seats and the manner in which we used our minds uh, at the beginning and now uh, speak to how much we actually anticipate coming into the presence of God. Now I'm not saying this um, scolding. I'm just observing. <clears throat> God gave us fellowship, and God gave us unity, and God gave us love, and those things have to happen in balance, too. So I don't think it's a bad thing for people to like each other and to feel unified and to come together and to appreciate each other's presence. But many times we evangelical Christians enter into um, preparation for a time of worship with uh, that kind of horizontal fellowship uh, because we haven't got our minds to a place yet where we're ready to elevate and we're ready to think about the God that we came to worship. At some point we sing the doxology, we begin the service uh, we have prayer, we have worship, and then our minds snap into focus. So I'm not saying that there isn't a point at which we come into that focus. But I think that one of the issues is, and I think this is sort of the import of, of this sermon, is that we human beings who do not see God but see each other and see the outward manifestations of church and the outward manifestations of our faith, we can very easily focus upon those things. And so we live in a faith that is some days and some moments more horizontal than it is vertical. And uh, that's kind of easy to do because we are human beings. We are flesh and blood. And we respond back and forth with other human beings. Um, so 
what I am getting at is we don't always see Jesus as he is. And I don't know if in this life it's ever possible to entirely see Jesus as he is. We see Jesus as the flannel graph or Sunday school book picture uh, person. Kind, loving, looking like an ordinary man. When I was um, about 15, I was traveling with a, a Youth for Christ musical group in the Midwest, and we stopped in a large church in Chicago. And in probably what was the last year of his life, uh, we met the artist Warner Salmon, who painted the uh, very the most famous uh, picture of Jesus Christ, the head of Christ, and other famous pictures that you would uh, immediately recognize. Somewhere in my uh, paper piles, I have something the size of a baseball card with the picture of Jesus on it, and he signed the back of it. But that picture is the most identifiable picture of Jesus to us in Western culture. We, we've seen that picture everywhere. And so that is what our mind kind of brings up. So what our mind doesn't usually bring up is what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 1. What our mind doesn't usually bring up is what Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6. What our minds don't usually bring up is what John the Apostle saw in Revelation chapter 1. Jesus Christ is eternal God. And Jesus Christ humbled himself to be contained in a body of humanity in order to identify with us, in order to be human, experience humanity, live all of his life without sin and be nailed to a cross at the end of it, to be buried like a human being and to be resurrected unlike a human being because he had power over death. And we commonly see Jesus in our mind's eye as, as a, a human being that we might meet on the street. Now again, this isn't intended to scold anyone. Uh, if, if it was, it, I would be scolding myself because when I think of Jesus, I was in Sunday school since I was very small, I tend to see the flannel graph pictures and everything else too. But Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, says this, Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, we're coming right up into Advent next Sunday. And that's what we'll be talking about. That'll be our emphasis for the month of December. will be that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. But because of the way we see him in our mind's eye, we tend to view him as rather ordinary at times. And it's no wonder we don't come into his presence with more wonder and uh, more awe than we do. With anticipation of experiencing a little of his majesty. And that's a goal for me. And, and I hope it will be a goal for you, if it's not already, that when we come into his presence, when we come here uh, and worship corporately, when you come to your time of devotions, that you want to be experiencing a little bit of Christ's glory, that you're going to go away uh, from your devotional experience or go away from your worship experience having really felt and seen a little bit of the glory of God 
Jesus Christ, your Redeemer, seeing and feeling a little of his majesty and with reverential awe, focusing your mind toward the moments of worship ahead. In that same passage from Philippians, Paul goes on and he says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You and I will grow in our experiencing of his power in our lives when we come to see him and ask him and permit him to flex our minds and expand our spiritual horizons to see him greater and greater and greater and larger and larger than he is as the holy and exalted one. And consequently, and this is very un-American and very un-Western, and consequently to see ourselves as small and unworthy ones who owe the eternal Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all of our praise for the glory of God. We see ourselves as nothing. We don't love to sing those hymns that, that say, I'm wretched and I'm a worm, you know, uh, as the old hymn writers used to say, because we don't like to think of ourselves that way. We are made worthy and we are made valued because Jesus has redeemed us. We don't start out that way. We don't start out that way. So let's go to Revelation chapter 1 for a few minutes. I'm not starting a series on Revelation, uh, but I'm landing here this morning. We've uh, got Joseph just as far as he could go, I think. And so uh, we turn to the New Testament uh, just to show that uh, we can actually do that. Now, Revelation chapter 1. The book of Revelation is called the book of Revelation in the Greek. The word is apocalypsis. Uh, in English, the apocalypse uh, very overused word, you know. Your weatherman will say, this weekend we'll have the snow apocalypse, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, not even close. In Latin, revelatio, a word which means the disclosure of that which was previously hidden. So, revelation is the revealing of Christ in his glory. Revelation reveals Christ as ruler of the kings of the earth, bridegroom of the church, head of the church, the lion of the tribe of Judah of Israel, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, the high priest of those who believe, the judge of all the earth, the word of God, that is the composite of everything God wants to say to the human race. God gave this book, the Revelation, to Jesus, written through John, to be given to us. He sent an angel, perhaps Gabriel, it doesn't say, to John, who wrote it down so you could hear it and read it. Uh, verse 3 talks about that in verse 1. It is the only book in the Bible that has such a direct promise of blessing to those who hear it, read it, and follow its teaching. It says in verse 3, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. It is the unfolding of truths and events of the future and John's present, which will happen in a short time. And when John uses the word short time, he is using a, uh, a Greek phrase which in the Greek indicates not that it's going to happen next week, 
but that when it begins to unfold, it unfolds rapidly. And that's the meaning of it. So people look at that and say, well, uh, the Bible says soon. But, and, and I wish that they would translate this phrase just a little better than they do sometimes, because what it really means is there's urgency and there's speed built into it, so that when the events begin, they unfold quickly. And that's, that's what the phrase actually means. And so it is the unfolding of truths and events in the future which will happen in a short time or very quickly once they begin to unfold. But they are events that are controlled and orchestrated by Jesus in cooperation with his Father. He is revealed to us in this book in ways which will cause us to give greater care and concern to our worship in his glory. John greets us on Jesus' behalf and the one who is and was and is to come. Jesus Christ always existed and shall eternally exist in the future. Uh, hard for us to grasp the concept of the pre-existence of Jesus Christ, that he always existed in eternity past. John greets us in this book on behalf of the sevenfold awesome personage of the Holy Spirit, and there are multiple references in the book of Revelation to something which is uh, mystically uh, awesome. And uh, Bible scholars explain it in a variety of ways. But uh, John, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, uh, chapter 4, verse 5, chapter 5, verse 6, speaks of the uh, seven spirits of God. Well, we know there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What are the seven spirits of God? And uh, some Bible scholars suggest that uh, the seven spirits of God uh, are various aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then they point back to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, which gives seven different aspects of ministry of the Holy Spirit in that verse. But um, we can't get too dogmatic about the doctrine because it's not, uh, it's not explained in the book. John identifies Christ as the faithful witness. What Jesus said can be fully relied upon, and that is important for living out our faith. Jesus Christ is a faithful witness. So when you have a sin that you've committed over and over, and here's another one that you've committed over and over, and you feel, God can't possibly forgive me again. We have the words of Jesus Christ, who's a faithful witness. And John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He's faithful. Faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why have we gathered here in this room this morning? Uh, we ought to have gathered because it is our holy obligation to serve our God and our Father. Why don't we always get more excited about that? When I was a kid, they, you know, they were describing heaven. Okay, golden streets, uh, all kinds of beauty. That all sounds really great. But then somebody said, it's like being in church all the time. Well, okay, I didn't, knew I didn't want to go to the other place because that sounded really uncomfortable. But I wasn't sure I wanted to be in church all the time. Why? Because I'm a human being, and I focus upon myself. And I don't focus upon God the way I should. I don't see Jesus in a, in a loftier way. I, I tend to focus upon myself and my own stuff. But a day is coming, verse 7, an actual date on the calendar when Christ is going to return. 
He's going to return from his church. He's going to return at the close of the tribulation period, and every living being will see him, even the dead who pierced him with nails and thorns and, and swords. They're going to see him. And those who pierced his loving heart with their sins as well. Who is he? This Jesus. He tells us again in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who was and who is, who is to come, the Almighty. So he, Jesus Christ, is the eternal, almighty, consciously existing God, and see how John saw him revealed, beginning to read it at verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. Now look at this description. His head and hair were white like wool. That's not Warner Solomon's picture. As white as snow, his eyes were like blazing fire. I never saw that painted in a picture. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Who's writing this? John the Apostle, last man standing, last one of the disciples to be still alive. John probably was the youngest disciple, so he's probably pushing 80 or a little bit past at this point in his life. He's on an island that's 10 miles long and 6 miles wide called Patmos in the Mediterranean, and the Roman Empire used it as a penal colony. There were minerals to be mined there, and they took people uh, that were criminals, and they sent them there. And John is a criminal, he tells us, because he is proclaiming the gospel. So he's on Patmos because of his testimony. And as an 80-year-old man, he's put to hard labor in the mines on Patmos. And on the Lord's Day, he has this vision, and this vision of Jesus and his glory and things that are future and things that are present in heaven. All of this comes out of this vision as he is on the Isle of Patmos. Jerusalem was already destroyed in 70 AD. John has outlived that. He's the last disciple and he's living in difficult labor, and he saw Jesus Christ, his Savior, ascend into heaven between 50 and 60 years earlier. And now he sees Jesus again in this spectacular vision. Uh, I announced that I was going to do a prophecy series in the first church where I was a solo pastor, and my... Uh, I had one elder in that church, and his wife didn't like prophecy because it scared her. And she said to me uh, that, that she was, uh, she threatened to boycott my Sunday evening because it was going to be Sunday evening I was going to do that. She said, because that scares me. And I read this passage, and she said, I don't like to think of Jesus that way. Well, we need to think of Jesus this way because Jesus is God. 
In Colossians 2.9, it tells us that he is all that God is in a body of flesh. How does that happen? That's the miracle of Christmas, the incarnation, the enfleshment of God. And so one day John is spiritually transported into the present heaven and future spiritual realms, traveling back and forth, it seems, from heaven to earth, in his visions at least, if not in body, but first having this vision of Jesus Christ in his glory. Now, did John ever see Jesus in his glory before? Yes, he did. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John went with Jesus up the mountain. And Jesus was glorified in front of them, and Moses and Elijah appeared and were talking with Jesus. John saw Jesus like this 60 years earlier. And now he sees him again, and Jesus is speaking. And Jesus is talking about his church, and he, he begins to talk about seven particular churches in Asia Minor. We know it as Turkey now. And those churches are all within a 150-mile geographical crescent. So think of all the American Baptist churches in Maine. And, uh, you know, pick seven of those, and it's like these books these messages, these letters went to those seven churches. John saw Jesus in his glory. And Jesus is speaking to his church and he's speaking about future things. And he has a voice like a trumpet in verses 10 through 11. And he gives John the message for the churches. And then John saw seven golden lampstands and Christ walking among them. And the lampstands uh, described the churches. And the uh, stars in his hand represent the, the messengers to the churches. We're not sure if those are pastors or angels. But John fell at his feet to worship in a death-like posture. Why? Because when we see Jesus for who he is, we are overwhelmed when we get a taste of it. The beauty is, and the reason, and I'm not sure I said this to, to my former parishioner decades ago who told me she was afraid of seeing Christ this way. Uh, now I know to say it, but I'm not sure I did then. Christ reached out his hand and touched John and comforted him and says, don't be afraid. And he gave John this great encouragement which should warm the heart of every Christian it ought to give awe and reverence to our hearts as well he placed his right hand on me second half of verse 17 and he said do not be afraid I am the first and the last I am the living one I was dead and behold I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and Hades. I hold the keys of death and Hades. I have life, past, present, and future. Who do you want to be your God? Someone who has control of life? Someone who has the keys of death and Hades? That's the one I want for my Savior. I don't want the man upstairs that's in the country song. I want the one that holds the keys of death and Hades. Jesus Christ is glorious. Jesus Christ is awesome. He is electrifying to every one of the senses of the human race. We need to see him for who he is. We're going to celebrate the baby born in Bethlehem. He is that. We're going to celebrate the carpenter with hammer and saw. Yes. Is he a humble teacher? Yes, he is. Is he a lover of children? You bet. A man of flesh and blood who could be put to death on a cross? Yes. But he's God in the flesh, conqueror of death, saver of souls, healer, commander of the storm, awesome, glorious manifestation of God's power and splendor. 
He is burning fire. He is thundering voice. He is the revelation of God. And when we come to worship, we are worshiping him. Praise God. Father, your prophet Isaiah said in the, king, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Lord, I pray that we, your servants, will see you higher and see your son higher and reverence your Holy Spirit greater as you are lifted up in our hearts and minds in the days ahead. We thank you for this church. We thank you that you are here. And Lord, we thank you that you are great and high and exalted. And we pray this in the name of the high and great and exalted name of the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray it. Amen.